Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks, Sherry. I'm Sharon, alcoholic, and it's really good to be here, and... um... It's not great being last, but (laughs) I guess I can jet out of town. Um, That's right. My luggage is packed, so if I don't do a good job, I'm out of here. Um, (laughs) But um, thank you, Dick, for everything, and Barbara and uh, Lee for putting this on. And uh, I, um, I know everybody in this front row very well, and I love them very much. And um, Sonia's song was beautiful. Because I think Alcoholics Anonymous is all about love and God. And, um, okay, I'll calm down. <laughs> Get my sponsor in the front row, so that'll, that'll, uh, keep me humble. Um, and I just, um, I love what I've learned this weekend. I wrote a lot of little things down that everybody has said, and, um, I'm gonna take them back and spread them around because that's, you know, that's why I'm here to get more seeds. Um, Many of us uh, are like Johnny Appleseeds. We're out in the world planting those seeds, and we just don't know when they're going to sprout, if ever. But uh, in my case, I was told I had a lot of good fertilizer to work with. Um, <laughs> I could just throw a seed, and it would, plant, it would go. So um, uh, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous August 20th, 1975, and I had much the same experience you had, Bob. It was just, without me knowing it, I was in the place I was exactly supposed to be at the exact right time because I was completely surrendered and extremely tired. (laughs) So I know there's a few new people here. I hope you are tired because, you know, I just didn't roll out of my bed in some ritzy community with everything I wanted in life and, you know, my masseuse waiting for me and my breakfast made and said, I think I'll come to Alcoholics Anonymous today. Um... I had to be beaten by alcohol and beaten down, and I was. So I came to you with a broken jaw in three places. My nose broke, and I had been left out up the side of the road uh, in the desert, Palm Springs, with a concussion and like a piece of trash. And I had that awakening deep down within me that helped me survive that evening, that morning, long enough to get to you three weeks later, three weeks and two days later. And I am very, very grateful that my mother has a spiritual program (laughs) because when I called her the morning of August 20th to ask for money with my jaw wired shut and uh, couldn't talk to her and she hadn't known that her daughter was okay for two nights because she didn't know what hospital I was in. So it took her a while to find out my mother in Iowa and my sister in New York calling all the hospitals in California because they knew I was in California but they didn't know what hospital I was in. And I was in there for two weeks. I was pretty badly bruised and beaten up. And my mother didn't sleep for those two nights. So the miracle, one of the miracles that happened in my life was my mother said she couldn't help me anymore, go to the Salvation Army. <laughs> $20, she'd have another speaker, I think, you know, because I might have had a plan the next day. But that day, August 20th, I had no plan. And it was a perfect time to get swooped up because... um I hadn't, I had a, a God when I was a little girl. I had, God was love. I knew that. I knew God was love. And I was always a seeker. Always. Sandy was talking about the Easter eggs, the Easter basket. At my grandmother's house, they used to hide the Easter eggs for all the cousins. All of us. And there were a lot of us. But the ones that were the most valuable were the ones that were over in the beehives. Grandma would put some over by the beehives. And it was always the bigger cousin boys that always got those eggs, except for me. (laughs) I'm one of those that you give me a challenge, I don't care if it's going to sting me, I'm going. I'm going in. And I would bring that gold egg back, and they would know I was by the beehives. So that's the kind of personality I always had was, let's go for it. I'm a seeker, I'm a more girl, and when there's more, I want more. And I'm so grateful in Alcoholics Anonymous that I've had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. 
because I get more God. I get more love. And because it's so much, I have no choice (laughs) but to give it all away, like the prospector finding the mother load. And I get to mine it the rest of my life and give every piece away because you've awakened me to that, that it's not about me. Um, Boy, I wish it was some days. (laughs) I really wish it was. But I have had that awakening that this is this life that I am in this skin, in this moment, in this room with you, is not about me. And it frees me. You know, um, Clancy was kind of talking about the principles last night that, you know, having had a spiritual awakening is the result of these steps. The result of these steps. We try to carry this message to other alcoholics and tra- practice these principles. What are the principles in all our affairs? And um, so I went back to my room and looked <laughs> looked up principles in the book, as many as I could find, and I found a whole bunch of them. Um, and I wrote them all down. I'm not going to go through it all, but there's quite a few of them um, in Bill's story and to the wives as in to the employers. It kind of lays out how we're supposed to act in the world and to our families. And, um, you know, the principles to me are things that I have learned with you, being guided through the steps, um, having my own experience with the steps, having my own awakening. I mean, I can sit back and there's nothing more fine than to watch you awaken. There's nothing more fine than to sponsor somebody or be involved in somebody's life. And I can't go switch on that light switch inside your soul. I can't put my hand in and do it. You've got to do it inside yourself. And there's nothing more beautiful than to be with somebody going through the process of working the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and they come to a principle of trust with you because you don't. One of the principles is not to gossip. It talks about that on page 127. And they trust you. And they're laying it out there for you. And they've seen your life and they know you can take them somewhere. And they trust you. They're in the dark. But they trust you that somewhere inside that dark, You've told them there is a light switch, that they have their own light switch. And I don't know about you, but I never liked the dark as a little girl. I just always had to have a light on, or and I was an insomniac as a little girl. I couldn't sleep, and my hamster would get out. We had a three-story house, and I'd hear my hamster gnawing on something two floors away, and then I'd have to go find the hamster, and then my turtle would get out, and he'd be down halfway down the basement two days later and dried up. And I mean, I worried about everything growing up. So if you put the light switch off, I was like, I had to have a night light. I had to have a hall light on. I didn't like the dark because, you know, they were in the closet. And, you know, big imagination. Four children, I'm the only alcoholic. Um, I had to run back to Grandma and Grandpa's as we would drive away, make them stop the car. I had to run back and give them kisses and hugs and because they might not be alive tomorrow. You know, I mean, little six-year-old girls aren't supposed to worry about stuff like that, but... And they just, okay, stop the car, there she goes. She's going to kiss Grandma and Grandpa again because they might die. You know, it's just kind of like, that's Sharon. You know, just intense. But the newcomer believes you, and they know that there's a switch there, and they're having their own experience with it. So, you know, they've come to believe. They're in the inventory. They believe that these amends process has worked for my sponsor. I've seen it work for others. They've been freed by this. They look different. Something's happening. They can walk down the sunny side of the street without looking over their shoulder. And But they know that there's still goblins and gremlins and spiders and you know, lions and tigers and bears in that dark room that they're living. And they know if they reach their hand out to the left, something's going to grab it. It's dark and they don't want to do it. They want to stay close in. But they trust you. They trust you, and, and you reach your hand over, and it's like, you know, your sponsor, got, they got their headset on in the room, and you're talking through to them, you know, telling them, put your hand to the left. No, I can't. No, I can't. No, a little bit further. It's over there. Promise. It's there. The light switch is there. 
all right, I'll just move it another inch, and if something grabs me, I'll never forgive you. You know, that's the newcomer, right? So they reach their hand a little bit, and they start to feel the plate of the light switch. Yeah, something might be here, but something's crawling on me. I know something's crawling on me. you got to tell me there's no spiders in here. Trust me, it's a light switch. It's not a spider box. You know, so eventually they feel the switch and they turn the light on and everything is great. And it's like, oh, my God, I, I'm alive. You know, I'm awakened. It's here. It happened. But it's a little bit slower than that usually. But the light goes on. And you see them across the room walking in the next night after they've done their fifth step. And you go, what happened? Look. <laughs> Changed her hair color. No, there's light in her eyes. Somebody else is there. God has appeared. And we've been given that responsibility to save lives, truly. Many mothers in this room are going to sleep at night because we're here. And if you're new, it's not about you. <laughs> Sorry. Come, on, come out from thinking about your favorite subject for a second, which is you. <clears throat> and if you're new, don't worry about a lot of you know, technical ways of working the steps. Just get a sponsor and have good feet for a while. Smart, good, happy feet. Take care of your feet. They get you to the meeting. Your head will not. Your head will, you know, that's broken right now. It's thinking too much. Your ego is still big. I think it was T.S. Eliot said that the ego dies screaming. <laughs> doesn't go quietly. doesn't go quietly. And I love to watch God appear in my life. I need God with skin on most of the time, so I need to come to meetings and sit with you and hear it read over and over and over again, chapter 5. And to look at you and know that oh, it's working for you. It's working. That's right. There's hope. I don't know how I can forget with 38 years of sobriety that there's hope. But I can go out in the world and interact with the earth people and come back to you and sit in a room. And as soon as I hear chapter five read, I start to get in my skin and exhale and remember there's hope. <laughs> like I forgot that there's hope all day long because I'm still that little kind of tough girl that wants to prove myself and get in there and 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 not be criticized but to do everything right and to outshine my older sister that Mensa you know who saved me from a fire when I was six too so you can't compete with that you just can't you know she's Mensa and she saved from a fire can't compete And I'm the one that, that broke my dad's heart. I'm the one that confused my family. I didn't know alcoholism. They didn't know alcoholism. But I have been awakened to the fact that my life is not about me. I have been awakened to the fact that, thank goodness God is in charge. Because my God is so big and so roomy and all-inclusive and so loving that there's nothing I can't bring to my God. Um, somebody was telling me a little fun story about a homeless guy and being cold, and the homeless guy said he was a sober homeless guy. It's not cold. You just made a poor wardrobe choice, choice today. The, the homeless guy said that you just made a poor wardrobe choice to the guy standing there that has a home and everything else. But the homeless guy recognized poor wardrobe choice today. Should have worn a jacket, you know? And one day I was out um, in my world working and going to the bank and having a bad day, and they weren't doing it my way, and I think my boss said something to me that day. Like, he's on to me already, in a good way. Um, he says, Sharon, I hate to criticize you because you take it so personally. <laughs> he said, but I'm telling you this in a good way. I criticize you because I want you to be better. Oh, how, it took him like two months to get on to me. It took me years and inventories and people telling me and humiliation and humility that follows the humiliation to be on to me. And he's got me in. It's those earth people. I don't get them. Two, he has me in two months. 
So I'm out there, and I'm kind of mulling over that he's on to me already. <laughs> and I thought, it was probably a couple years ago, I was about 36 years sober, so I'm really spiritual, having a good day. And I have to go to the bank. So I go by this homeless guy in the corner of the light where I have to stand and press the walk button. It's in Century City, and it's fountains and flowers and big buildings, and it's all very beautiful. And... Um, they send the homeless usually to Beverly Hills where they treat them nicer and um, true. But there was a guy there that day and he's hanging out and he was drunk and he had found a camera and he was taking pictures and pictures of himself and he was laughing and he didn't know how to use his camera. And I'm having a bad day and I thought, don't flash that at me, buddy. You know, I'm not even going to look at you. I had that look on. And uh, I went over to the bank and... The walk button is going right by him again. I wanted to go the other way, but the walk button's going right by him again, so I have to go by him again. And standing at the light, and I can feel him looking at me. And I'm just about ready to go, what? No. You know, when I'm in that mood, it's what? No. And uh, so I had a moment. <laughs> this is, my son says this all the time. Mother, that's a human being in front of you. Okay. Um, he's not an alcoholic. He teaches me things all the time. He's not my sponsor, but he could be some days. Um, and I looked down at this homeless guy, and I was just not quite sure how it was going to be, but I didn't say anything, and we caught each other's eye, and he looked at me, and he goes, looks up at me, and he looks down at me. Then he looks back up at me, and he goes, cute shoes. <laughs> And God spoke to me that day, lighten up. through a homeless man noticing my shoes. So you never know, really, where it's the pearls are going to drop from. Um, so being awakened to the laughter and the joy is a huge gift because it talks about joy... Um, we will live in a wonderful world no matter what the present circumstances are. And many of us in this room have and have had and will have, every single one of us living in, on this planet will have circumstances that will shove God out and let my ego back in. And when it comes in, it's painful. It's almost like a... You can feel it. I can feel it come in now. When I was seven years sober, I cleaned myself up and out enough that I had had that spiritual awakening. And I didn't realize it in many ways until um, I stood up and took my birthday cake. I was seven. And I didn't expect it to happen, but I was standing at the pudding saying my name and my disease, and I got shot through with love all the way through from the tip of my head to the tip of my toes, warm, beautiful, loving, hugging love. And I didn't quite know what it was. It just kind of scared me for a minute. But it felt better <laughs> than anything I had ever taken out there. And I was part of the 60s, so we combined a lot, you know. <laughs> And uh, Woodstock wasn't happening back then, and um, it just happened. Just much like Sandy was talking about, Alcoholics Anonymous just happened. Um, but what we do with what we've got is for the future of Alcoholics. And it's for the now, and it's for the future. And uh, one of my principles is Perseverance. I never knew how to stick it out. I had backpack on with a book in it called Be Here Now by Baba Ram Das. Um, I didn't even have a man or a dog at my heels anymore. I was better traveling alone. I liked tequila. I joined the carnival. I lived in the French Quarter. I went to organic farms. I grew crop. Um, I disrupted every courtroom I could in the 60s. I was part of the peace and love generation, except I forgot the other half of the peace sign most of the time because I'm an angry angry alcoholic and when I drink I can just like who cares 
Who cares who's hurting who in the world? Where's the astronaut? Someone in here said he was an astronaut in the bar. Who's buying? Oh, the doctor's buying. The surgeon, right? And you can be what you want to be in the bar. Just let me be who I want to be in the bar. And um, But I've learned how to be loyal. And my loyalty starts with my membership in Alcoholics Anonymous and the gift that was given to me on August 20th, 1975. Because um, I had no principles, I had no standards, I had no laws to live by other than out of my way. <laughs> Where are we going tonight? What's your name? Oh, Bob Dylan. Okay, met Bob Dylan. Aspen, Colorado. Never really knew if it was Bob Dylan, but we traveled together and could have been. Um, <laughs> Uh, by the way, just an aside for you Dylan fans, his uh, electric Fender had uh, sold for the most money ever for an electric guitar, $800,000 at Sotheby's this week, the one that took rock and roll to electric. Um, and yeah, I met Bob Dylan, so I thought. Um, so I'm that kind of girl, where are we going? I had no loyalty. Um, even my dogs would get hit by a car, hit by a truck in Biloxi, Mississippi on the 4th of July. You know, they left me too. They got killed, but they left me. Usually I was drinking and fighting with someone and they're trying to come to my rescue or I forgot to give them water outside the bar or awful things I had to make amends for. Awful things. I still lay awake at night thinking about those animals. Um, people had a choice. They didn't. <laughs> um, so I made my amends all the way through to the animal kingdom and to my parents and to a lot of, um, to New Orleans, to the French Quarter. Uh, I got to persevere in those amends. I didn't stop. They were on my list. I had, my sponsor had me write them down on recipe cards because they would shuffle around with what was, what was important. Like when I first got sober, what was important was paying back the people that were calling me for money, and they were usually just the bar drinking friends. They were finding me. I was still in town and that, you know, sober, and she's working, and she can pay me back. Um, but some of those other amends, like how do you, how do you pay back all the little kids you ripped off with the carnival? How do you? I mean, you know, quarter. I was a shooting gallery girl. I hung my flash, and there were nights I was drinking my tequila, and I didn't want to give out a teddy bear. I paid for these bears. No, no, you didn't. You didn't knock those three little metal things down. I'd flick it back up and call them crybabies. <laughs> Tell them to go talk to their dad. And they did, a couple of them. Um, and the fathers came back very angry with me, and I made somebody, and the carnival got closed, and then I got... Next couple towns later in Bogalusa, Louisiana, they threw me in jail because of my... Um, bartering goods that were in the dog food and the trunk of the car and some other things. And so my dad got to see me in that situation in a jail in Bogalusa, Louisiana. My dad in Iowa, my amazing father, who I hadn't sat and had breakfast with for years. Because he's got Mensa Nancy, Nurse Sally. She was four. She got a nurse kit and wanted to move to Alaska. And that's what she did. She knew her purpose at four at Christmas. She got the present. I never got it. There's a eight millimeter movie of us opening our presents at Christmas, and I am like a frantic person looking for the right present. And everybody's opening their presents, and I'm done. Where is it? Where? It's not what I wanted. Um, nurse Sally got her nurse kit, and she knew what she wanted. So my dad had those two daughters that were terrific, and. Then, you know, he had his son. It was a special place. And then there was Sharon. What is she doing? She's kicked out of art school. She's bringing people home shoeless in February that are post-verbal. They don't even talk. They, uh, <laughs> she's changed her name to Cher, S-H-A-R-E, like Sharon, Cher alike. What? That doesn't make him happy, I can tell you that. She corrupted the family priest. We were at a love-in 
in the student union at the University of Iowa when they came down to help me after I had cut my wrists, committing suicide because my fiancé cheated on me, and the priest and I got drunk on whiskey sours at dinner with my dad, and Father ended up in this sit-in in the union with me that night, and my dad is standing like as far from here to that door just with his arms folded going, look what she's done to the family priest now. So my dad and I had no connection. And I had to persevere with that with him. So that he, when I first got sober, they would talk to each other, Sharon's Sharon's an AA. They couldn't say it out loud at all. Um, And it took a good couple of years for them to realize that when I changed an address, I stuck to it. My older sister couldn't write my addresses in pen anymore in her address book because she put a piece of tape, write a new address, put a piece of tape, write it. She couldn't close the book anymore, so she put me in pencil. And my first book in Alcoholics Anonymous, a man named Maurice Zolotow gave it to me. At our Echo Park meeting on Wednesday night, I landed in the Pacific Group, had no idea where I was. I thought I was with the mothership people because I'd been looking my whole life, and and then this man came up with this big book, and he would, oh, Alcoholics Anonymous, I saw it in a bar in Barney's Beanery. That's right, that girl was too drunk to drive. We sent her off to A&A in a cab and gave her a toast. I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous, because that's what the book said. And Maurice wrote in pencil, I still have his handwriting in my first big book, <laughs> my name, he got my name out of me, even though the first three months in AA I couldn't talk, I, had talk. I was wired up. With this broken jaw, I had to learn to listen. It was a blessing in disguise. Um, (laughs) And he got my name, and he wrote where I was, and he wrote my sobriety date in pencil. So I'm still in pencil. It's a day at a time. (laughs) I love looking at that because it reminds me of detoxing in Alcoholics Anonymous. It reminds me of having no life when I got here. It reminds me of having... Just an ember I brought to you. That was all that was going. I had been touched by that great fact deep down within. When I was laying in that ditch and that voice said, get up, I want to live. And I paid attention and that voice was commanding my attention now. That voice that was not me because, see, I can, I'm a perfect victim. I can justify everything that has happened to me. And it starts with my family. And God's in there, too. God's in there, too. So with my family, I had to not just run home in my first year. I had to persevere with them. They had to see I was okay. They had to, they, they came out from my father, walked me down the aisle of my first marriage in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I think we all have a couple, some of us. Not Linda and Bob, but or Clancy and Charlotte, or Dick and Barbara, my goodness. You've had a few, Polly. (laughs) (laughs) Mari, too. Can't put you in that category. I'm glad we didn't know each other drinking, Mari. It would have been trouble. I know that. But my dad came to Alcoholics Anonymous, went to the Pacific Group. I don't know if you remember this, Clancy, but he stood up. My dad's a businessman, he's 6'2", he's a big guy, had a construction business and big hands and he's Czech and he was just commanded presence, he was just that kind of man. And he stood up and he said, my name's Frank Meyer, I'm from Mount Vernon, Iowa, I'm here to give my daughter away in marriage. And everybody said, hi, Frank. (laughs) Nobody yelled at him, you're not an alcoholic, sit down, they just said, hi, Frank, because he was proud to stand up. Because he liked you guys. He thought you guys were pretty cool. And uh, little did I know that somebody was going to snap a picture that day and we were going to be eye to eye. And it's funny what you remember. It was that Peggy Lee moment. Is that all there is to a wedding? You know, <laughs> I was having one of those moments at my wedding, sober. And uh, my dad came over and talked to me. And I remember what he said to me. He said, <clears throat> Sharon, look at your life. If I were you and I was going to go 
back out and do what you were doing, I'd think twice. You got it made here. And part of me, being the perfect victim, but you had changed me enough, was going to say, yeah, it's about time, Dad, you noticed. You know, very humbly, I was going to say something like that. (laughs) But you had changed me enough that I felt the presence of God. I was awakened for a second, and I said, you're right, Dad. And someone snapped a picture at that moment, and I never noticed that photo until I was going through photos about, I don't know, 10 years ago I was moving, and I saw that picture. I was like, I remember that moment. You gave me that moment. And I was awake for it. I didn't slam it down with my victim cloak, which is still in the closet, um, deep in the back, wool black and itchy. And... um, (laughs) If I want to try it on, that's how it feels. But um, So I have been awakened with the steps and going to New Orleans to make those amends. And Clancy was, we were on that trip together. The whole group of us went down in 1980 to the International Convention of Alcoholics Anonymous in New Orleans, Louisiana, really. Um, and... Sandy was talking about how Ebby looked to Bill, and I they didn't hear these people I was finding in the French Quarter, my old bosses that I stole from, my drinking buddies that I owed amends to, a couple of them. Um, there were three of us girls that were the three musketeers in the French Quarter, Danny, Robin, and me, Mama Cher, because I had gained a little weight back then. I guess I was bloated and toxic and... Red dashiki in a Panama hat, 170 pounds of no gallbladder, pancreatitis, and alcoholism. And just how you cleaned me up, that's what the word out in the street was. You should see what that ANA has done with Mama Cher. Just how you cleaned me up. And um, I got to be awake to um, 12-step Robin, one of those three musketeers. And she's sober 30-plus years now. And the other one, Denny, um, I got to be an example to her, too. And she's just in January, we'll have 30 years. And um, Denny uh, owned the Blue Saloon in the French Quarter and then got sober and went to law school. So she went from the bar to the bar. And... Um, <laughs> She researched my felony in the state of Louisiana and got me pardoned for fun and for free. And I'm so grateful that that freedom has been given to me in many ways. I don't have to be a victim anymore. I had that awakening that it's not about me. And my marriage, when it fell apart and I was an example to many of the Women, I was sponsoring an Alcoholics Anonymous of a good marriage, and my husband, because life happens, he found a newcomer in the back of the room that he had more fun with, and he turned into a punk rocker, and I was secretary of the group, and I was pregnant, and he would come in bandanas, and, you know, all his tats showing, and a broken nose from being at the Dead Kennedys concert, and this guy's sober, you know, and crazy, crazy. And then he met Jill in the back of the room, who was... Uh, photographer for punkers and newcomer and they started up and I had this new baby that was born and my sponsor Ginny had smoked pot in Paris and I uh, she was supposed to have 21 years and she had 21 days when I picked her up at the airport and she'd been there for a year doing a play and my life fell apart and I have good I have been sponsored from the beginning with people that have walked down the path taking the time to come back and sit on that lonely rock with me and tell me what's ahead. And if I have the willingness and the trust, I walk with them. And they give me that. So I've had good sponsorship. So at 10 years when that happened, I was, and my husband was fooling around, um, I was scared. I was frightened. Fear was big after I dropped her off at her house. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I drove to Clancy's house. Now, I've been in that group since the beginning, and um, I had 
enough respect for him as a sponsor that I knew he could help me. Um, I didn't know if he liked me very much, and I don't know if I liked him very much. He was a lot uh, gruffer back in the day. Um, you guys are getting the, the calm Clancy now. Um, feisty as he is still, but... Um, I went to his door with my baby in a stroller, and I said, I think I'm in trouble, and I need a sponsor, and Ginny, and he said, yeah, I heard about Ginny, and he said, we'll try. So we've been trying for 28 years. He's been my sponsor, and I had the awareness to get a sponsor at that moment, because I am a sponsor, (laughs) and, but I also was blessed to have a sponsor busier than me. And I don't care what else I thank him for, I thank him for that. Because he doesn't say no to AA. He doesn't say no to going to the mission and stepping over the people that are dying from alcoholism and going to work every day. No, he's retirement age. He should be hanging out. But he's an intense guy, and I'm an intense person, and... I have to be of service. I have to be of service whether I want to be or not. I get up in the morning and I'm of service to my pets who are all rescued and love me because I've made amends to the animal kingdom. (laughs) And that's a beautiful way to get up and start your day. I start my day by saying good morning to God in bed. And I say God about 50 times so I can get out of bed. I say God, 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 so I can get out of bed. That's the way I need to start my day. Because sometimes at night my head wakes up and it wants to talk to me when I open my eyes. So I need to um, listen to God's voice before I listen to my voice because I am still part of me, that independent girl with the backpack on, self-sufficient, I don't need anyone. And I'm still learning how to forgive her. But what other basic truths did I have and in, my, in my sponsorship? And do I want to stay in a useful life? Absolutely. Absolutely. When I came here, it was just because I was tired. And I have been given the keys to the kingdom. I have been given the secret, which is I struck the mother load and I get to mine it the rest of my life and give every piece away. Every piece. Every piece peace. And that's, if you are going to be in this awakened state, you are going to be inconvenienced. And they're going to call at the wrong time. And they're going to want to see you and work a step when you're tired. And you're going to have to call somebody back. And you have to be nice to the security guard in my building. And just, it's a lot of work. I'm a lot of work. (laughs) I take a lot of work to be in God's light where I like to be. Because once that that had happened to me, like it did at seven years of sobriety, that's where I love to live. And I can't live in that intensity all the time, but it's in my actions. It's in my actions, and when I least expect it, that sixth sense, the behind-my-belly-button feeling, that tug of what I need to do or who I need to call or is there for me to listen to and to take action on it. And action and action is one of the biggest principles in my life that I live. Because I put my feet in the middle of what I need to do. Um, my dad uh, got killed in 99 and was gone in a second out of my life. Um, And we were good because I had listened to a sponsor, my second sponsor, that said I should pay him back the money I owe him, and I did. And um, that was one of those principles I had to be consistent about and put care and thought and love and patience into because we weren't just I just didn't run home and we were at the hardware store picking out tools together or you know having a discussion about when he came to see me in Bogalusa Louisiana jail you know we weren't it was still a little bit pins and needles and is she okay and 
is she going to ask for money again? Is, you know, when I got divorced, they were very worried about me. And the amends step that I did with my father, paying him back the money I owed him, taught me something huge about amends. Taught me that those amends I made to my dad, sending him that money every month, because he read the book, he knew how much it was, he ran a calculator tape. So when I called him, he was ready for me. And my sponsor said, send him on time, don't be late, show him you're a good example of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, but send him a note about your life, too. Mensa older sister, Nurse Sally, Miles carries the family name. What does he want to hear from me going to the jail panel for? Do it anyway. And I did that for almost five years. So when... When my father passed away, we were good. But, um, you know, when I came home, it was still tense. But it was starting to get a little bit better because of those amends that I was doing with my dad. And when I was, uh, after five years, it was Christmas, and he said, Merry Christmas, I don't want your money anymore, but don't stop sending me your notes. And my dad and I got to have innocence in our relationship, which was beautiful, which I didn't expect. And... When I went through that messy divorce and my car blew a rod on the freeway and I called home every Sunday night and I have this little baby boy <clears throat> named after my favorite grandpa who I told lies about until I you know, was able to not tell lies about that anymore because I felt bad I couldn't walk from the bar to the hospital four blocks to say goodbye, Grandpa, when he died. Um, and I called him and told him that we blew a rod on the freeway and, you know, it was kind of had to get towed because it was Sunday night and we talked every Sunday night. My mom, my dad, and me. And I put my son on the phone and he mumbled some words. And um, two days later, my dad called me because the amends were for him. Paying back that money was for him. Chuck talked about rubbing out the record. That amends was for my father. It was for all that forgiveness in our relationship. So that he called me in two days and said, I was at the bank the other day, and the banker's got a couple of cars. And um, he's got one that we think that you could use. So your mom and I are going to drive it out from Iowa and um, to California and give you this car. Now, I took cars from my dad that he never saw again. And my dad and mom wanted to help their daughter, number two, that was having some problems with a messy divorce and some financial troubles because I had to go back to work again and didn't really have a career going at that time. It was for my dad to be my dad and my mom to be my mom. And they were able to help me for fun and for free. Powerful stuff. Powerful awareness for me to know that later on, of course. I didn't like go, oh, gee, we're being dad and mom here. It was like, I got this much later. But my dad was freed up to give me something I needed. Another um, big forgiveness thing was with this ex-husband um, that married the girl in the back of the room and... I remember Clancy was my sponsor, and I was still, I was in a state of, I was humiliated. <laughs> and my friend Don N. wrote in my big book, hum humility is what is left when the pain has been removed from humiliation. Oh, thank you, Don, you know. It's painful right now, you know. So I'm walking to see them one night. They're, you know, Saturday nights, date night, and they're like, pregnant and married in that order. I don't know what stage they were at yet at this point, but they were back there by the coffee pot. I'm up here by the coffee pot. Clancy's in the middle. I don't even know he's in town. He's in, hardly ever in town Saturday night, but if he is, he's at our meeting Saturday night, and I'm on my way with two big hot cups of coffee over to say hello. <laughs> and I'm ten and a half years sober, and not aware or not, you know, I'm, I'm hurt. I had the victim cloak back on. I was sitting in the middle of you letting you see my pain. Um, 
being a great example of Alcoholics Anonymous, but not caring. Go ahead. I had that attitude. Go ahead. It's my seat. Walk over my legs. Too bad. You all knew. No one told me. I hate all of you. I'm betrayed. Oh, my God. That was huge for me. Betrayed. In the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. Nobody told me they're having an affair. So I had a little bit of an attitude problem. Um, <laughs> and I did go to a Cramps concert with my husband once. We was, they were a punker group. And I made this big shirt that said Might All on it. So I would have my Might All shirt on at the AA meeting with my Madonna white spiked up hair and my attitude. You betrayed me, you guys. Nobody told me. So I'm on there. I just, I don't know why I'm going over to see him. We don't talk, but I'm going over to see him. And Clancy's there in the middle, and he kind of surprised me. He stood in front of me, and he grabbed my shoulders. He put the coffee down, and he said, look me in the eyes. You'll walk through this with dignity and grace. Because he saw where I was going. He could see the look in my eyes. I was pretty intense. That's the trajectory. Yep, I better step in. And he stepped in. And if he would have stopped at dignity and grace, I didn't, I wouldn't have heard him. He said, so you can be an example to others. <sighs> Awake. <laughs> Awake to my behavior. Awake to what I've been doing. Awake. Okay, here's the keys to his car. The spare said I was going to drive it to, down to the beach and let the high tide do its trick. And <laughs> I had a lot of plans. And thank goodness I had enough awareness to ask somebody louder than my head to be my sponsor. So you can be an example to others. So I had to give it up again. I took off that victim cloak. Oh, there's people in the room I have to be an example to. I didn't quite give it up, you know, but almost. And I went and got a job. Go get a job. Somebody taught me how to dress, what to say. I Still working in the legal field today. How'd that happen? I have no idea. Give, give, give. Um. <laughs> so they uh, got married, and then after they um, they got a, a divorce, too. Um, how they come is how they go sometimes. And she told me she knew she could walk through it because she had watched me. Ouch. I was an example of walking through a messy divorce with dignity and grace to the person that I was mad at. That was the reason. And that's happened to me a lot because this is bigger than my little designs and plans. <laughs> Key word in the big book with that phrase, little I like being on the broad highway, and the way I can be there with all of you is to know that there's a hand here and know that there's a hand here. And I'm a link in the chain, and my job is to take care of my link, to keep it shining. So I'm so glad that I have had good sponsorship to help me stay awake. Yes, I do steps. Yes, I work with the girls. Yes, I... You know, back in the 70s, we were having real 12-step calls, and there's some people here that are older than me, and they, you know, they got to experience that. My last 12-step call was an insomniac that, unfortunately, the office gave my home number to that kept calling me in the middle of the night. And finally, I said, do you have a drinking problem? Yeah. Well, you're an alcoholic? No, I'm an insomniac. And it was like, you want to go to a meeting? No, I want to call you in the middle of the night. And it's like, okay, um... So, but those real 12-step calls, I was living by the airport. I was married to a man with a letter B. Uh, they had a Rolodex back then. I got to go to seedy motels with, women's, with women that had black eyes and take them to meetings and learn how to, you know, I remember Clint had to help me calm this woman down because she was belligerent and I didn't know what to do. And then she calmed down and I think she was in a blackout. I don't know, but I... Went to her bed, and he was sleeping there, the guy that gave her black eyes, and I'm reading her the book, and she probably came to the next day. I never, I said, I never heard from her again to my sponsor, and, well, did you stay sober? Yes, I stayed sober. It's like, good, and I got to do a lot of those kind of 12-step calls and see myself, see myself. And um, faith without works, boy, 
that's a principle. I um, I need a lot of faith, and I get to sponsor a nun, and um, it's kind of confusing sometimes. Um, so I'm not quite sure who the sponsor is some days, but I get to tell her at the end of every conversation, don't worry, Sheila, I have faith. <laughs> it's our big joke. Um, but she has a, a principal of the school, and she was a principal of the school for many years, and my son got kicked out of the Lutherans, and I called Clancy, and I'm crying because I know what to do. You call your sponsor when your son's kicked out of school. And he said, give him to Sheila. I said, I sponsor Sheila. I don't care. Give him to Sheila. So I took my son to that Catholic school because I, me and God had a big fight in the American Martyrs Church in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I got that priest to come out of the confessional. I had him so mad at me. Everybody in line was like, why, God, what'd she do? You know, it's like we were yelling at each other because I started talking money and politics about the Catholic Church, and I really got him mad. So I was able to goad him and to go, see you and your God, buddy, you know, because that's what I was good at. I'd pull you in, let you see it, like my father saw my pain, and then I'd back him off, and he couldn't help me. And so he had no choice but to shut down with me. And just the miracle of doing these amends. And Sheila and the Catholic school and the, meet me at Mass and I'll take you to dinner. And I'd come in and sneak in at the end of Mass in the back and they'd be talking about peace and love. What? When did they start talking about peace and love in this church? Um, I was able to let it go. I can go anywhere, anytime, and God is with me. Anywhere. And um, so my son is in that school for eight years, and they have a school carnival every spring. And that's where I got to make my amends, was buying kids ride tickets and <laughs> tickets to go try to knock those cats down and win a teddy bear and work the ticket booth and count the money and serve the pies and call bingo, whatever they needed for eight years. And... Uh, I'm so glad that that awareness was there for me to grab and to have that healing and that forgiveness and to let my faith become part of all of it. And when my father was killed, I um, they were married almost 58 years, my mom and dad, and it was sudden and it was hard and... This is, a, this is, a, <laughs> I just look back, I think I was just so selfish and self-centered. And we're at my dad's wake, and this is his funeral, and this is the weekend, and I'm home, and my son's home, and my son knew his dad, uh, my, his grandpa, and, cause I sent him home every year. I sent him home to Iowa, learn how to weed a garden, and plant strawberries, and have a hammer, and, you know, know how to hang out with Grandpa and Grandma. And, you know, he had a very special relationship with my dad. I'm really glad for that. And there I am, and I, I have this accordion, and I'm going to play this number for him. I'm going to play Amazing Grace, and I'm an accordion player, and the closet sax player, and a little bit of a piano player, and I gave all that up for drinking, along with my art. I gave it all up. Alcohol asked for it, and I gave it up. And I'm trying to awaken to that right now because it's back in my heart. But at this juncture, when my dad was killed, I wanted to play his accordion. I wanted to say something, and I couldn't. And I knew if I played him Amazing Grace in front of the whole town, in the church, in my family, it would be okay. So I picked up his accordion from Czechoslovakia, and it's all buttons. It's no piano keys. How that? Okay. And I worked on it all day long, all day long. And I uh, get to the wake, and nobody knows who I am. These people in town don't, they think I'm Nancy, for God's sakes, the Mensa. <laughs> I should have melted a little and blown their mind, but I didn't. I, uh, was, I was hurt by that, and I, nobody remembered me. Now, which one are you again? So I was getting a little upset, and I went to call my sponsor, who had been out of town, out of the country, 
in Africa when this happened, and he couldn't, I couldn't reach him, and now I know he's back. So I'm in Iowa at my dad's wake. It's raining like crazy. I have the accordion here. Nobody knows me. Nobody likes me. I might as well go eat worms. You know, I'm just like, and I am awake enough and aware enough that I better go call Clancy. <laughs> so I get in the rectory, and I call him, and he doesn't answer. I'm on hold. So I call back. And I say, tell him he's got 60 seconds. You know, I'm really into myself. And Clancy gets on the phone. He said, I'm sorry I wasn't here. I heard what happened. I'm, I'm sorry that happened to your dad. And, and I'm starting to cry now because I just need somebody that loves me and has an ear about who I am and what I'm about. And I said, I'm supposed to play this number, and I don't know if I can, and it's all buttons. And you know how you, you hear some one of those cries from somebody you sponsor, and you got to go, take a breath. Okay, okay, okay. You know, you're trying to decipher, did they, you know, did they, you know, run over their cat or did they just have a bad hair day? You know, I mean, it's... and he said, Sharon, calm down. You're going to do a great job. So I started to calm down and he said, you know, do me one favor. When you're playing that number, look around the church because I tell you, there won't be a dry eye. You're going to really honor your dad with that song. But pay attention. There will be a couple of people in that church sobbing. And those are the musicians. <laughs> Where's the love? Yeah. <laughs> right out of myself. That's what I need my sponsor for. Right back into humility. Right back into action. Right back into suiting up and showing up. Right back into letting God go in first, right back into what can I do to help. What That's what it's about. And um, my husband had, my first husband had a heart attack, and I was in the, um, went to the hospital to take his son to see him, and it was my son's first communion, so he was little, and, and uh, they, you know, he went to have, somebody was sitting there reading the book to my husband, and my ex-husband, and so they went to have coffee and food with my son, and then I'm there with him alone. And he's got tubes and stuff, and he's laying there, and then he starts having, like, his legs were going crazy. He was having leg cramps. And I'm pressing the button for someone to come, please come, please come, you know, and then nobody came, and I know I'm a, I'm a lifeguard. I know what to do with leg cramps. I know how to rub them. So I just threw up the covers and started rubbing his leg cramps, and that's something that happened at that moment. I had that forgiveness. I had that moment and that awareness and that forgiveness. I was able to forgive him, and it came back to me. And, um, you know, I I have no animosity toward that man at all. I mean, even I just stopped even asking him for the child support, which was never coming anyway. So I just learned to... My sponsor said, you can go that route or you can get a better job and make better money. And I got a better job to make better money. And that's the way it's been. And uh, I met my Casey, and uh, many of you knew him. And um, we were together 24 years. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my dad. I'm going to talk a little bit about love, and then I'm going to be done. Um, cause love is the most powerful really never dies, ever, ever dies. What you put out with love, it just keeps passed on and passed on and passed on. And it's paid forward and tenfold. And, and I want to thank you, Charles, also for picking me up with all your love and care. One in the morning at the airport and taking good care of me and showing me the Christmas lights and being part of the Mercy team that flies people with their chemo for their chemo treatment. You're a great guy. Thank you so much for honoring me with your presence. Um, my uh, my dad knows his daughter was okay. My mother knows her daughter's okay. She sleeps at night because of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I met my Casey and we um, had a good life together, and we were better as partners as we were separate. I think that's the beauty of true love. I think that together you're better. You work at it. You got to be better, but together you're better. I think we were more effective as partners together. And um, I don't want to correct you, Sherry, but what he said to me when I went to Cocoa Beach was he said, tell him that I'm sending my best and it's you. And that's the way he thought about me. 
And that was the last couple years of his life. But um, we finally got married. Boy, everybody was happy about that, um, <laughs> including Clancy. Um, we eloped in Vegas, and my son walked me down the aisle, and it was beautiful. Yeah. One year, one month, and I don't know, 14 days in the hallway between that messy divorce and meeting my case, it was well worth all of the pain and the inventory I had to take again and the more amends I had to make. And I was talking one night at a meeting, this is about my dad and how we just really don't realize what our actions and how we live by these spiritual principles affect people because we just don't know. You don't get to see a ripple hit the shore every time you do something nice. Just you do something nice and you go on with your life and so do they. And I was talking about this um, town drunk in Mount Vernon, Iowa, who used to come and borrow bottles from my dad who had the business. And it was a state-controlled liquor store and it was a little harder to get, but I always had booze. I always had booze. And um, one day I came to my dad and complained about his wife because people talked to my dad and they just came over and talked to him. And he said, you're an alcoholic. It's not your wife's fault. Go to AA and help my daughter. Maybe it'll help you. And I, my dad had been gone a number of years and I spoke about this for some reason at a Thousand Oaks meeting one night and this girl came up to me afterwards and she looked vaguely familiar and she said, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah said, you know, I think you're talking about my Uncle John. I said, I am. You look familiar. She said, oh, I'm Lizzie. And I said, oh, my God, I babysat you. I'm sorry about the pot, you know. (laughs) More amends to make. She said, that's my Uncle John, and he's still sober. And this is from Iowa through my dad to me in Thousand Oaks, California, on a rainy night. And that little girl said to me, she said, I went home to a family reunion and Uncle John tossed at me and I had two years. So every once in a while you get to, if you're awake and aware, you get to see a ripple hit the shore. So many of them were making. And my Casey was the man of my dreams and we had a lot of life together and a lot of love together and we had our problems and I had to eat crow a lot. You know, eat it when it's warm. It tastes better. Do that quickly. Um, <laughs> slices a little easier. Tastes a little better. It's still awful. But I learned to say I'm sorry and I didn't mean it and what can I do and how can I make your life better. And when he got ill with malignant melanoma, they gave us seven months. But we got over two years. At class, you'd see him every night. And people in my group would see him every Wednesday night sitting at our home group in his seat, no matter how he felt. And we got on planes and did a lot of things, and we got two years. Two years. And life was a day at a time. Sometimes at the end it was one bowl of oatmeal at a time. But you walked with me and didn't let me fall so that I could help him not fall. And he made everybody in that room where he would go for his clinical trials feel better when he went because we had his first annual golf tournament in his honor raising money for the clinic this year. And the oncologist came and he talked to everybody about Casey's stories, uh, the first uh, tee. And then Casey's sponsor, Johnny, was there and he said, yeah, but he wasn't that spiritual. So then we got the other side of it going. It was really it was good. <laughs> it was good. But he said, when Casey came to the clinic, everybody felt better. Because that's the stone he was throwing into the pond of life that day to make some ripples. And um, briefly, the day he left this planet to go where he was supposed to go, I could hardly breathe. My chest was so heavy with love. So much joy in the whole thing. Calamity was serenity. Joy through every piece of life. Even the finality of never seeing him physically again. He left so much in my heart 
because of Alcoholics Anonymous, because of good sponsorship, because of principles, because of steps, because of being awake to the needs of each other here, being awake that we get to save lives, that mothers get to sleep at night because we're here. What a privilege. What a privilege that we get to do this. Um, Okay. And I end with this story because it kind of tells you how I could have blown it at one point. And <laughs> my family picks me up at Cedar Rapids, Iowa Airport. It's my sister's wedding weekend. She's getting married. Everybody, everybody's in the van. They pick me up at United Airlines at Cedar Rapids, Iowa. They're all in the van. I had flown overnight. I was getting there early before everybody else that was coming in, and my son came in, that kind of thing. But I realized as we're driving that my dad is talking to my sister like she's a financial wizard. And he's asking her opinion about some money things. And you know what? She is a financial wizard. She retired at 50 with lots of money. But why is he asking me? I made all those amends. I mean, (laughs) this is where I'm going. And then in the back, my mother, who loves me, who was like your mom, Polly, she stayed up and did hems. She made me outfits, my synchronized swimming. She sewed me all that stuff. My mother was terrific. She's talking with my sister about the fashion and what they're going to have for gifts for the bridesmaids. And nobody's asking me. I'm L.A. fashionista. Come on. you Nobody's talking to me. And my brother is sitting there talking with his new brother-in-law who's a commercial fisherman in Alaska, because she's still there. Um, <laughs> and she's, he's talking to her, you know, he's talking to my brother about fishing, and I thought, Miles, we put more worms on hooks than we can count. I know how to fish. And then I realize I'm having this, like, I'm sitting in the middle, and I'm cathartically sobbing. I'm like the only one not talking to anybody. I'm going, <laughs> I don't fit in. See how it is. They'll never be the same. And <laughs> alcoholic. And I need to call my sponsor or whatever. I'm just sobbing. And my father is on the country road now going down to the house. And he turns around, stops the van, and says, are you okay? He hears me. Are you okay? Oh, here they all are. Right here in one spot. And my father just laid out the soapbox for me to get on. But blessedly, that morning, in the O'Hare airport, where there's this one terminal that just it seats off to the side, and I was tired and waiting for my connection, and I had a little 11-step work that morning. Thank God, because in the middle of all that, and me getting ready to launch and ruin everything Alcoholics Anonymous has given to my family... I heard a voice that said, get out of the van. Get out of, okay. I got out of the van. My dad handed me some water. They're back to the conversations like I'm not having this big upheaval spiritually in my life. And, you know, I'm from Iowa, but it was always so corny. Pigs and corn, and I felt like pigs and corn. I had no worth as a human being. I lived in New York City, worked for an ad agency. They always knew I was from the Midwest because my voice. And they say, are you from the Midwest? I say, yes, I'm from Wisconsin. Because I had cheese. It seemed much more dignified. Pigs and corn. So there I am in Iowa with my family in the van, not paying any attention to this upheaval I'm having. And there's this corny cornfield in front of me. And I'm looking at it, and it looks a little different at that moment. It looked beautiful. The colors of green were fantastic. The tassels that were being formed seemed to have life and light about them. And there was kind of an aura above the whole. You can really hear corn grow in the summer. You can hear it. It makes noise. You go out and sit in a cornfield, and it was life. There was life out there. And I thought, well, being from Iowa is not so bad. I guess I'm feeling... A little tired, but I'm okay. I'll get back in the van. And as I turned around to get back, I saw it, and I'd seen it my whole life. I sat in those cornfields looking for the mothership. I know how they're planted. 
I saw it was all laid out in rows, and it hit me a little bit differently that day. That God, we've worked on the fertilizer, we've planted the seeds, we've rotated the crops, whatever needed to be done to have those beautiful seeds sprout into this beautiful cornfield that has been thought out and planned and loved, and it's taken time, and it's all laid out in rows. I caught that look as I turned around. And I knew God had me in the palm of his hand. No matter what was going to happen, I was going to be okay. So that's uh, some of my awakenings and some of my awarenesses and that I try to carry this message every single day of my life and wear it like a loose garment. And uh, my husband, uh, when he was sick the last couple months, I was sitting at the table with him having a cup of coffee. I'm going to end with this story. And he said to me, um, how are you doing? I said, not so good. I don't really think God's in this whole thing going on here. And he's the one that's hurting, and he's the one that shows up when he's... I had the flu, and I could hardly even walk across the room. I thought he felt this way. He's, for the last two years of his life, he felt bad, but he showed up. And I said, I don't really see God in this. Um, I'm having a little problem with God right now. And he said, I know... He said, but look outside, the wind's blowing. It's like, it was blowing. And he said, do you see the wind, Sharon? Do you see it? I said, yeah, I see the wind. He said, yeah? What do you see? I said, well, that's hitting the side of the house, and that's rolling down the street, and the trees are waving. And he said, no, do you see the wind? He's having a grass up, a sensei moment here going on. Not quite sure what's happening. And... Uh, he said, you see the effects of the wind, right? Oh, yeah, I don't see the wind. I see the effects of the wind. He said, that's me and God right now. I don't really see God in all this, but I see the effects of God. I see the people who love me. I know I have a program of Alcoholics and I listen to God. That is so huge. It will take care of all of us with this. So go out today and look for the effects of God. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.